thank you all for joining us for today's talk. Um, modern DLP, why everything about DLP today is wrong. Um, thanks very much for uh, taking the time. I know there's a lot of different presentations going on, obviously. So we'll have fun over on this side, and uh, hopefully we'll get some interesting questions and thoughts uh, going through your mind as well. And we'll have, should have some time for questions as well at the end. My name is Steve Chan. I'm Senior Director of Information Protection for Proofpoint. And let's go ahead and get started. So why DLP? Um, what is it good for? Well, let's just do really quickly a remedial review of it. Um, obviously, from a regulatory and compliance perspective, um, DLP is pretty critical for folks to deploy that from an organizational perspective. It might be vertically oriented. It may be geographically oriented. We're seeing a lot of, obviously, talking to a lot of customers who um, are, are sensing issues from a GDPR perspective, but it also are things that are specific to an organization, like intellectual property. Um, that's a big reason why we deploy uh, data loss prevention solutions. But some of the other reasons are really critical for us as well. Um, when we look at mistakes, and traditionally for DLP, this might be something I accidentally sent something sensitive in my email. I may have concluded something sensitive in my email. Those are exfiltration use cases that we see quite a bit. As we go through the digital transformation, we see more folks moving to the cloud. Um, accidents are happening on a much more significant basis simply because the cloud makes it so much easier to lose things um, accidentally as well. But by the same token, as we move to the cloud, something else is even more critically an issue, and that is attacks. When we're talking about the cloud and we're talking about the digital transformation, we are now exposed to a wide variety of different threats that we weren't before. And this is something that uh, DLP doesn't have a strong sense of, and that's one of the tenets that we'll be bringing up when we go through this talk today. So DLP today, basically this is a series of different observations that I've made. It's really based on information and insight that our customers, you guys, have uh, basically exposed to us, and I'm really just making some of these observations. And some of them go against what legacy or traditional DLP efforts uh, may, may talk about, but I think they bear um, raising. The first one is DLP, it faces the wrong way. If you think about DLP, data loss prevention, what does it really mean? How would you define that? It's almost as if you're assuming that data loss is just going to occur, whatever event upstream has happened and then we just have to do as much as we can to prevent it from leaving our organization. I think that's a little bit backwards. And as point of fact, this, this picture is kind of a perfect representation of that. I've got my great equipment, I've got my whole team, we've got all eyeballs looking for data loss. When really, the problem that I have, my biggest threat, is right behind me. So in doing the, building this slide out, or building this deck out, um, I did a little research and lo and behold, Ponemon Institute last month was nice enough to really bring this home. So this is a global data breach study that they do annually, and their headlines are, malicious or criminal attacks cause the most data breaches. I couldn't really say it any better, and so let's dig into the numbers a little bit more. If we look at this type of attack uh, or data breach, um, they're seeing this across all countries and organization types, across all verticals. Uh, about a quarter of your data loss uh, uh, events are going to be by mistake, human error, human mistakes, um, which we know about. And then another quarter are system glitches, so kind of machine-based mistakes, if you will. Um, but fully half are due to malicious attack. So my question is, when we talk about DLP, why is it that we're not talking about threats and attacks then? If this much of our data loss event is occurring because of malicious attacks, shouldn't that be part of our thought processes, even if it's upstream of us? So the first thing that we're going to talk about or add to this list and we'll go through it is that modern DLP has to be threat aware, okay? Little kids are very in tune and insightful when things aren't exactly working out right. Um, there's, this little gal is going to be a great CISO when she grows up, but she definitely sees that this is not a normal bunny and she can be rightly concerned. So when we talk about modern DLP and where we should be headed, we need to make sure that DLP is threat aware. Okay. So 
DLP as tunnel vision. I have to be honest, um, I really just wanted to use this slide, but it really is just very funny. I don't know if anybody's seen anyone wearing one of these, but it does kind of give us the, the notion of the tunnel vision. And there's two areas, I think, that DLP suffers from this um, uh, dramatically. The first is related to data and data classification. Not that it's not important, uh, it is important, but I think it goes to too great a links and too much of a focus around data. And there's reasons for that, and we'll get into that. The second area where DLP has tunnel vision is in infrastructure, and we'll talk about that as well. So if there's any biologists in the room, this is something that you may uh, recognize. Um, but the notion that I want to bring out is in our talks with customers, a lot of the discussions around building a DLP plan um, kind of get muddied by and understandably so, by data governance speak, or the idea that we need to classify all information in a highly accurate way. Um, and the concern is, well, we're not gonna be able to do a very good job unless we totally classify all of our uh, information uh, at a high, high resolution. And this, for da data loss prevention purposes, isn't exactly true. It's definitely true for data governance. We're talking about retention policies and records management. But for data loss, we really just need to know, is it sensitive or is it not sensitive? And we'll talk about that more later. But there's a lot of resources, time, and effort that goes into classification. By the way, the reason I brought this up, this is basically uh, Carl Linnaeus is, uh, I guess you'd call the inventor of uh, organismal classification. And the reason I brought this up is because some of the file plans that I've seen from customers looks almost like this. It's so detailed um, that it, from a Dale Peel perspective, it'd just be uh, unmanageable. So let's go to infrastructure. I believe DLP is too focused on infrastructure. And as a proxy of that, let's look at the IT security spending breakdown. We see that a vast majority of the IT spend is through network technologies, uh, which I would consider infrastructure. We're looking at endpoint, breakdown of web gateways and email. And that's great. But if we look at where attacks are coming from, where potential data breaches could be occurring, let's see what that looks like. And the breakdown is pretty telling, right? Whereas 8% of the spend is on email, excuse me, 93% of all breaches are phishing attacks that target people, and 96% of those phishing attacks are via email. So when we think about spending on infrastructure, but we see that the attacks are actually going against, in this case, email, I wanna broaden that out. It's not email, the bad guys are just looking at people. And this is kind of a corollary for us. Um, bad guys don't attack infrastructure. They attack people because that's your weakest link, right? And if we drill into that a little bit further, we have a concept of very attacked persons. And from this is a anonymized breakdown of the top 20 in a higher ed uh, organization, an institution. And what's very interesting is that very attacked persons are not necessarily mapped out to the same set of very important persons. It can be, but it not always is. There's a variety of reasons why any given individual may be uh, more attacked than others, but for any given organization, it's important to understand that mapping so that you can protect yourself suitably. If the bad guys are going after certain individuals or accounts, it would make sense that you want to prevent them uh, or protect those individuals more so than maybe the rest of the population. And so that goes to the next level where your VAPs, your very attacked persons, will tend to lead you to your most significant data loss risks. And this makes sense. It's important to use that information. And they, again, may be targets because they happen to be part of a brute force attack or they may just be a more high profile threat. Individuals may have access to particular more sensitive data or have access in general to other services. Or perhaps a lot of folks are just individuals who engage in more risky online behavior, clicking on links, going to more risky services on the cloud, et cetera. Now, ultimately what this boils down to for our next level is to look at modern DLP is that it should be people-centric. Okay, so let's look at people, not infrastructure and data. Again, not that they're not important, but we need to focus on people to a much greater degree, uh, degree than we are. So the next level, and this ties back a little bit to what we talked about data, is that DLP is binary. 
Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the insight that we can get today, particularly from traditional DLP implementations, is really around whether or not data is sensitive or not. It's not a lot to go on. You could overclassify, you could classify more data, but really is that classification going to help you to prevent uh, a large number or more data breaches than not? And the answer is really no. Um, data can only let you go so far, but data loss prevention technologies haven't really caught, caught on to that. And we'll talk more about that as we get into some of the later parts of the slide. And I also cover um, a use case at the very end so you can see all of this pulled together. But what we really need to hone in on is that data is not um, the key focus. It's part of it, but context is actually more critical. Right? We need to know more than what binary information data can provide. Is it sensitive or not? We need to know from a people-centric view what are the access and behaviors that we see from that individual or that account because that's going to give us insight into how they're working with sensitive data. It's going to give us a sense of how they're exposed to data and what that risk level is for that individual. And more importantly, and we'll go and see that example when we've gone through the, the use case um, at the end, if we have explicit in information about threats, is that individual subject to threats? Have they been compromised? That's going to give us pretty much um, uh, a totally explicit uh, information that, yes, this account has been compromised. We should be confident that that will be a source of data loss. So instead of looking at DLP as binary and strictly looking at data, we need to, uh, we need to pick up the, the insight that modern DLP is fuzzy. So uh, <laughs> I had to switch this slide because I'm such a nerd. Um, when I first made this, my, I actually had a dial to show fuzzy as an analog dial. Um, and my daughter said, Daddy, you're so dumb. Why don't you put fuzzy like this little fuzzy animal? So I said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So anyway, um, my daughter is helping me with my, my presentation, Jess. Um, so DLP is threat centric or threat aware. DLP is people-centric, and DLP is fuzzy. So let's keep going. Uh, DLP is everywhere. Um, anybody who has had to implement a DLP uh, uh, engagement or try to create a successful DLP engagement kind of will understand what this means. Most of the vendor technologies out there uh, have basically attempted to put more sensors in more places of infrastructure, so at the network, at the email, uh, uh, email gateway, in the cloud, at every endpoint. But it's not just that. It's actually even beyond that. It's locking down USB behaviors, USB use, um, print screen, um, printer use, anything that you can. And, and in many cases, when we talk about what somebody would, I guess, typify as a successful DLP implementation, it would be having full control of all of that. Um, and that's actually a nightmare. When you have that much data coming in and you have that many points of information, uh, there's also a very high amount of false positives. And so in the discussions that we have with any of our customers, we've just been fed back, well, we bit off more than we could chew. We've done, we've, we're taking too much information and our teams are not going to be successful in managing those implementations. And so we realize that when DLP is everywhere, there's really no winners, right? So, I mean, some of the vendors might be winning. That's not a, a good, that's not a good reason. What we really need to do is rehone what we're looking at into a manageable way. And I would argue that for 99.99% of the organizations out there, they would not need the kind of draconian, um, Orwellian, if you will, uh, big brother view of it. But instead, they could benefit from a much more targeted view of the key vectors, the top modern vectors for data loss, which would obviously be email, which is also a traditional key vector, and the cloud, right? And email is clearly a double, um, uh, a double threat simply because it's not only an exfiltration pattern, uh, ve vector or cha channel, but it's also uh, part of the attack chain getting in. Um, but for cloud, and especially when we're talking about enterprise file sync and share, like AKA OneDrive box, 
those solutions are ideal for exfiltration because that's what they're designed for, right? It's for collaboration and sharing, just not with the right people. So we want to focus on those vectors for data loss, and we want to look at it not from strictly a data perspective, but from a people-centric view so that we've got data classification, we have behaviors, and we understand threats against those vectors. So what we take away from this is that modern DLP is focused. And we've got to hone in on those pieces that are most important instead of boiling the ocean and understanding or trying to understand every other single piece of data that's out there. Um, a few more observations. Um, and these, some of these are going to be pretty obvious to you, but I'd like to um, include them so that we can raise some discussion around it as well. Um, DLP belongs in the cloud. Just like anything else that we're moving from an IT perspective, uh, transformationally, it's beneficial to go to the cloud. You've got a variety of different benefits. At the same time, um, that transformation has resulted in a lot of the different threats that we're seeing that we didn't before. But the benefits are, are manifold. So if we look at modern DLP, obviously we're talking about converting it to a utility uh, model, a very low cost of entry. Um, OPEX versus CAPEX, just like anything else. But if you are modernizing it and you're pushing it to the cloud, typically, and this doesn't have to be by definition, but typically those solutions are also going to be more well designed around uh, cloud-based architectures or more modern frameworks. And so you'll have fewer FTEs, obviously, because you're not dealing with on-prem infrastructure and databases. But you'll also have uh, less fatigue from a variety of different angles, both alerts, et cetera, because many of these solutions, again, built on proper frameworks, will provide a lot of integrated points so that e uh, admins will be able to do less but learn and understand and visualize more. Also, these platforms will have uh, unified, plat uh, unified policies across all of the different channels. So you have a single location from which to manage your policies and govern those policies. So you have a consistency of compliance. But the most, probably the most important piece that we'll see is with modern DLP, the ability to deploy in a very rapid fashion. Simply because the infrastructure is already in place, it's really just activating for different customers. Um, and this is critical because DLP is notoriously, traditional DLP is notorious for taking months to years to successfully deploy. And assuming that you, there is a, there's a maturity angle to the solutions that we're looking at, if they are also in the cloud, the effectiveness will go up. And so many customers that we talk to, they take the first two steps, classify and visualize, to get a sense if they're just starting out with their DLP strategy. And then as they become more comfortable with the, the work that they're uh, anticipating, the attack surface that they have, they can engage in deeper protect and response um, uh, efforts. Uh, but again, it's really important not just to be de developed in the cloud or for the cloud, but to also be a mature solution. So we'll talk about that in a bit. The cloud also helps improve usability from the perspective of more and more users are obviously doing more of their work, their efforts in the cloud, and they can save and share across any of these modern channels. Classification is going to be leveraging all of the things that you might imagine, um, from regular expressions, the dictionaries, to things that are a little bit more advanced, like document fingerprinting, uh, exact data matching, and things of that nature. And one of the things I, uh, that's really important is how do we respond to that? Obviously, there's nothing that the cloud cannot do if you have different pieces um, in, the, in the way of on-prem data. You may have um, certain agents that are on-prem to handle that, but many of the different elements, including email, are going to still be in the cloud. So you'll be able to do prevention, encryption, et cetera. One of the things that we should see with modern DLP solutions would be um, something I'll, I'll go into more detail, especially with the um, especially with the example that I have. But if we look here, one of the responses is something that we're seeing more and more of, which is multi-factor authentication. Especially when you're dealing with cloud, this is a critical piece, and if used properly, is going to be a game changer for technologies that are looking to both protect and um, commit to a better uh, DLP posture. And again, I'll give a, a deeper example as we go forward. So modern DLP overall should make DLP much more effective across all of those different areas, and as a platform, should be much easier to manage overall. So I'm not done yet, so this is, that's just from the cloud perspective. So if we think about it, modern DLP should be cloud, uh, very cloudy. Um, but many of the times when I go through this talk, we talk about modern DLP, uh, we talk about the cloud, 
customers get confused when we uh, refer to this because they think that that's the same as a uh, new DLP or if we talk about new entrance to DLP. And the reality here is that there is a, a vast difference between something that has been designed as a new technology, built on cloud structures, uh, leveraging more modern frameworks, et cetera. They can be very cloudy, but as an application, still be too immature. Um, this is a situation where we have um, solutions that may be a couple years old. They've been, they have all the aspects of a fantastic uh, cloud application, can be deployed very quickly, et cetera. And all the pieces, just like this little gentleman, he's got the cost, uh, the uniform, he's got the tools, um, the equipment, and certainly the desire, but he's just not ready yet. Um, one of the things we need to look at when we talk about maturity, uh, because DLP is such a difficult and sophisticated technology, it's been around for almost two decades, to do DLP well is very difficult. Um, to be able to work out for admins the right types of workflow, the right types of dashboards and information for just something like incident management is very challenging. And if you're dealing with it every day, admins can be very easily overwhelmed if you have bad workflows around that. And so as these solutions develop, it's important to recognize that there's a maturity level that needs to be um, recognized. And the last piece, at least for this portion, <clears throat> is the notion that in response to that, you need to identify better experiences. So what do I mean by that? The best way that I've described the difference between a mature and modern DLP solution versus, say, um, a new entrant or new DLP technology that's just getting into the space but is built on cloud principles is a trip. So if I take a trip uh, going from A to B, and I have two examples, my first trip I step out of my house, I step into a vehicle, and from that point forward, I'm carried through this, um, maybe I've, I've, uh, I'm working with a, a nice agency, and they take care of everything for me, all the way, and I'm using all the new technology, et cetera, and I go all the way to point B, I get out, and I've completed my trip, and it's been very, very easy and straightforward. All of these issues that I have, have uh, uh, encounter have been thought through, and they're easily addressed. In the second, if I'm a new entrant going in, I do the same thing, I step out of my home, and I get into my vehicle and I travel, uh, I take my car, but now I have to handle and be aware of all of the different problems that I might have. And it may not be necessarily a smooth ride from having to worry about getting to the airport, uh, go from the, uh, my shared airport rider, which is always a fun experience, riding down to, uh, down to uh, the terminal and then getting through uh, from the plane, plane ride, et cetera. So there's a lot of different steps that can harry you all along the way. And unless the solution is really smoothed out, I'm having to concern myself with these issues. And that last mile is also tough. So what happens is you may get most of your effort done, but that last mile remains something that I still have to walk through. And I'm lugging my bags, get off the subway, and get to my door. And that's something that causes a lot of um, headache, especially, again, if we bring it back to the DLP use case with admins. So when we talk about that, if I have to make that trip maybe three or six months a year, every three months, every six months a year, that's not so bad. But if I'm a team of analysts, I'm a team of DL, uh, on your DLP team, and I have to do that every day, that is a nightmare. And that's something that we increasingly see from customers is that they uh, are understanding and realizing that the effectiveness of their team really has a big part to play with how well that solution has been designed and worked out for them. And so that's a big part of creating a better experience for those users. So these are the things that we've talked about today. These are kind of the observations that I've made. Um, I just want to walk through a use case that will kind of pull them all together, or most of them. And so if we look at an effective DLP deployment um, with threat awareness, what does that look like? So we talked already about how it's a little bit binary if we're looking just at data. Um, and it's fine, right? From data protection perspective, we've always been looking at that. But really, it's sensitive or it's not. It either permits us to uh, communicate that information or not. And if we look at things from a people-centric view, it's really important to convert this um, when, we're, when we're thinking about modern DLP. So we're looking from a people-centric perspective. Data is one of those axes. But another axis is going to be access and behaviors. And the third will be threats. So these are explicit threat intelligence. 
So let's go through that example. We've got a user who uses um, and is ac has access to a variety of sensitive data, and their typical use pattern is a dozen or so different sensitive files per day. Now, over the course of a week, they've changed their behavior. They're now increasing the amount of sensitive data that they're accessing, and we're seeing this. Um, on its own, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands of new files. It may seem a little bit anomalous, but do we think that this is a genuine hit or a genuine breach or genuine concern? It may or may not be. And actually, in, in uh, case studies that we've worked in and customers that we've worked in, um, we've actually seen this behavior quite a bit as people change their task for the given month or what have you. And so it's not a guarantee that that is actually a true hit. But if I have a third axis and the ability to see certain things such as threat intelligence bound to that account, I will know more. So, for example, if in the process of changing his behavior, we also find that this individual um, is accessing the account or accounts that they're leveraging through an IP address that we condemned maybe three months past uh, as part of a larger campaign, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty hard evidence to, to, to recognize. We can shut down this uh, account. We can shut down the behavior there because it's clearly a threat. Um, but this is when we're looking at it from a people-centric view, and if we're only looking at data, would we ever be able to see this insight? We wouldn't, right? And if we were just to act on um, access behavior, we wouldn't know that either. It really requires some of these other elements to call it in to be able to pull that, um, re recognize that threat. The other thing that we, we need to understand for modern DLP is that we need to look across channels. So email we've identified as a critical channel, cloud is a critical channel, but being able to get information and especially threat intelligence from any of those channels, again, email is clearly the number one uh, attack vector. When we looked at that slide earlier, we talked about how 96% of the uh, breaches uh, or phishing attacks are through email. Guess what credentials they're phishing for? massive majority of that are cloud credentials. And so they do work together from that perspective, and so having that insight is really important. Um, by having this sort of 360 degree insight, we also reduce the level of false positives that the admins are having to deal with, and we're leveraging it from a policy perspective. And this helps them, instead of having to run off for every little incident, the policies can actually take uh, advantage of the insight that's provided, and execute on some type of response. Now the last piece here, what happens if I don't have any explicit threat indicators? What can I do? Um, now, it may be that I just send an admin out there, but what's gonna be nice is as we see more modern DLP solutions coming into play, um, this, uh, we will see more um, a prevalence, I guess, of MFA, multi-factor authentication capabilities to leverage. And so what would happen here? So if we're not sure, it could be on any basis, we're not sure that something is um, kosher or not, um, that this access behavior is, is, is kosher or not, and let's say we don't have explicit threat insight, we could actually pop up, a, uh, or sorry, set up um, authentication on demand during an event, not necessarily at login, which people do all the time, but actually on demand because certain parameters of access and behavior are not clear to us and a little bit um, questionable. This, makes, uh, this is made automatically, and this is something that the admins do not have to get involved with at all. And if that individual is able to trigger their MFA and successfully um, uh, authenticate themselves, they're able to gain access. And that's, again, something that is automated and something that allows for the admins to stay away from that. That kind of a nuanced approach is part of this concept of modern DLP and uh, being threat aware as well. Okay. So, that's the, that's the scope of my talk. Does anybody have any questions on that? I covered a lot of stuff. I do have a question. Yes. Yeah, 
on the user. No, it's a real. That's a really good point, point. Um, and I did not plant that gentleman there. Um, that apple is um, is representative, and I didn't go through this slide in detail. Um, I didn't want everybody to fall asleep. But the apple is indicative of um, some capabilities where you do exactly that, where um, a DLP event is detected. Let's say it's via email, and there's an attempt to be sent. Now, there are a variety of different downstream options we could leverage. One could be automatically encrypt that or something like that. But it doesn't help with an education. Um, I don't know if that's a universal um, icon for education. But um, if we bounce it back, as, as you're saying, that use case is very helpful because it can educate the user that that was a bad move or you should not have sent that information. Maybe they weren't aware that it was actually even there in the email. But now that we've sent it back, we can give them a templated view and say, hey, this was this classified under this, it violates this. Did you really want to send it? Because there could be a legitimate reason for that. And if they do, they can send it and then it can go in some encrypted fashion, what have you. Right? If they didn't, they can delete that email and start over. Or maybe just send the, the, the parts of it that were not sent to them. That's a great point. Thank you. The, the the notion of threat and DLP, have you guys talked about that? Is that a, a key area that you guys have seen before, or is this something more new to you? Yeah, I have a question. Maybe not watch the whole uh, presentation. Sure. Uh, maybe you already mentioned. But for the data classification, who is doing the classification for data? So this is my question. Is can you start being a better which one is okay? Yeah. No, so every so again, all of these things that we, I'm talking about are really from observations of our customers, and we've seen everything, right? So, customers have pushed it, pushed it to their employees. That is definitely um, a possibility, and then you have to have sort of client level tools or something like that that will allow you to do some um, classification. That absolutely does exist. Um, obviously, there are hybrids where uh, there's classification that goes on automatically and suggest certain terminologies, et cetera. But if you see the vectors that are where this kind of, um, uh, where exfiltration can occur, and we focus on email and cloud mostly, you can look on-prem as well and do some discovery. Um, it's important that you have sort of a safety net as well, right? So that, and that safety net needs to be connected and integrated to whatever system you have applying the, those policies. From our perspective, the simpler you can get your classification uh, approach and profile, the more successful you will be, especially from a data loss perspective. I find that when we start talking about user level classification, that is actually, it's partly a DLP issue, but in large part, it's a push from the data governance side to classify their internal data, which is, again, also important. But it can get really confusing because there's a lot of choices that they can get exposed to, and that becomes problematic. But there is no, this is the way to do it, or that's the way. It's really what, what the what the organization feels is most likely, and your population may be better suited to doing that, or it may not be. Um, we also, the, uh, I'll leave it at this. We've also seen customers where um, they have uh, a set of stewards, and they're responsible, just a small set to manage and classify all the data for a population of, of broader users. Uh, so you can have experts deal with that, quote unquote, within your organization, as opposed to making it something that every individual content creator is, is responsible for. Any other questions? And, uh, this is all, I, I, I just want to know for me too, this is all kind of rote or things that you've seen before, or, or are they areas that are a bit new? Any, in which areas are new to you? It would be a great question to follow up on, if there are any. All new? OK. Well, then I would say this is a great starting point. <laughs> because I feel that most of data loss prevention views, and they should be changing, are really around data. And again, it's very easy to get caught up in this notion of let's classify it in the most accurate way possible, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're spending many resources doing that as opposed to, I don't know, looking to the side and seeing this line sitting there, it's my threat, um, when threats are causing half of the data loss events that you're, you're experiencing, that's a problem. Because whether you've classified it so perfectly will not 
change the fact that your last your end up decision your decision ends up being is it sensitive or it's not it's it's either one or the other regardless of how detailed my my classifications yeah you mentioned that you focus on user not that much on data and you also mentioned when you roll attacks on yeah So we look at certain vectors. The easiest vector, because it's the most leveraged, it makes it easy from our perspective, is uh, email. It's, that's where most of the attacks come, right? There are some others, but that's by far the most common. And so we can detect, um, or vendors can detect, we're not the only technology in the marketplace, that can detect threats as they come in. Now, taking that information, and applying it in a intelligent way to your potential data loss, that is unique. There's nobody else that we are aware that does that. Um, there are plenty of companies that have that capability, but because of how they're designed or whatever, they haven't seen that yet. Um, threat is a huge part of Proofpoint's particular business, um, and so we obviously highlight that, but I think you know, we don't decide what Ponemon finds, it's clear that it's important, right? So when we see the threats attack, we can see who the bad guys are targeting. And we can also tell, is this attack going to a broad swath of different users kind of indiscriminately? Is it a brute force, if you will, or a broad attack? Or are you the only one receiving that particular attack? If you are, I would be more worried because there's an actor that's targeting you specifically, either that institution or individuals within that institution. And we can see that as well. And then when we combine it with cloud data, because we're access, because once, once the digital transformation, I have a whole nother talk that talks about this, but once the digital transformation occurred, we as legitimate users accessing our cloud services look exactly like any bad guy out there, unless we go down into the details. So unless I get the telemetry that this is coming from, let's say, a device that I've never used before, or a, ge a geography that I've never been at, right? It's very hard to tell that that's a bad guy. But if I start pulling that insight in, then I know, oh, not only am I getting attacked from email, but some guy is accessing my cloud resources or tempting to access my cloud resources. I should be careful. And that's more important to data loss than anything else I could do from a data classification perspective. But then you have different roles within that institution. You do. You can use that as a factor. It's, it, our job is to provide you with that insight. And all that I'm saying here is that when you look at very attack persons, there's a, there's a softball coach that's up here in the top six. For whatever reason, that softball coach is up there. Maybe they have access to things that we're not sure. It may be because they happen to be on social media more than other people, and so they're more exposed. It could be a variety of reasons. But that's an entry point. And what we're seeing, and this is an, a thing I didn't actually touch on, Recently, we've been seeing a lot of bad actors where they attack an internal target. And maybe it's somebody who is, just happens to work in risky ways and clicks on things that they shouldn't. But once they get inside, they do not trigger any kind of data breach. They sit and they do internal attacks. They do internal attacks. And I think you as customers are seeing this more and more. Being able to detect that as well as a different type of technology, which we've developed because we had to quickly, but that's something that they're getting smarter. They're not just you know, uh, shooting right away in terms of getting uh, uh, data uh, rapidly once they've committed the breach. They're actually uh, committed the, the compromise. They're actually taking their time, getting more compromised accounts internally, and then committing uh, a deeper data breach. Um, is that, I don't know if I, I answered your question, but yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's, it's all, that information is there and it's up to you as an organization to decide, okay, maybe the present president or the director of the organization, maybe they need to be protected more simply because they do have access to valuable data, right? They may not be, currently they may not be at the top of the charts, but that can change every week. And we see that happen all the time. Any other questions? You, you were nodding quite a bit, so I, I, I was positive inclined to think that I was hitting or hitting a chord. Any thoughts? Well, I, I work for franchise tax board, so obviously the question is number one, priority for the tax payers in and out of the business and personal. And we have highly, a lot of time spent on classifying data. Um, 
Again, not that it's wrong, but... Yes. Why? Yes. It helps to highlight that our security paradigms that we're used to, where we think of CEO, CIO, these are the guys that are going after that they're not, lets you educate in a different way. Hey, person that's not on the computer very much today, they're really not going to do you because you're probably not going to do that much today, and maybe you're not physically seeing these. Things. Yes. Yes. And, and you have to keep in mind the the folks that are the bad bad actors. They're not sitting idly. They are very busy, and if you can call it that, they're hard at work and aggressively doing research on their targets. So what happens is, like you said, there might be somebody who is. Um, let's see if this works. Who is a, who's a, 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 an officer of the organization, but they're not, uh, the attackers aren't going to go after him necessarily. They'll look at LinkedIn and they'll see, oh, this is the assistant to that individual. And that happens quite often, that we'll see at the top bar of a different profile, the assistant to the CEO is the number one VAP, right? Because they have access to sensitive data and they often send communications broadly to the company on behalf of that individual. And so you're absolutely right. You cannot assume certain things about who's going to be attacked and, and that education in itself is really important. And that, that's actually part of our business has expanded into training and education as well as this type of prevention. Okay, I think we are out of time. So thank you so much. Um, if you want to know anything else, we have a great team uh, at a booth down in, at the very other end. Um, and so please come by and ask any questions that you may have. Thank you.